Right. We left off in review. We actually finished Psalm 4. We left off with some uh, important perspectives. Uh, we left off uh, two weeks ago in regards to verse 3 said, But know that the Lord has set apart for himself him who is godly. The Lord will hear when I call to him. Be angry and do not sin. Meditate within your heart on your bed and be still. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. There are many who say, who will show us any good? Lord, lift up the light of your countenance upon us. You have put gladness in my heart more than in the season that their grain and wine increase. I will both lie down in peace and sleep for you alone, O Lord, may we dwell in safety. In reviewing that, the week prior to that, we discussed the seven things that would hinder our prayers. And there's many, many more than seven, but I shared with you seven. Anybody know one? One out of seven. Sin, yes, unconfessed sin. Lack of faith. Yeah. Lack of faith, okay. Not praying about praying compassionately, not really mean what you're praying and asking for. Okay. Unbelief. Doing pretty good. Doing pretty good. <laughs> Gentlemen, what's one that applies to us? When we discuss this, Bill said that's not him. So I don't think he's going to help us. First Peter 3. The hair of a need is going somewhere around my ear. It's driving me crazy. Uh, a bad marriage. Not honoring your wife. First Peter 3 and verse 7. What put the answer? I just, you said tell you, you said give you a hit, and you would get it. So, and then how about this one? This one just still shocks me. Um, as I continue to think through it more and more, what, what benefit is, is it to lie to God in your prayer? Huh? But yet, Psalm 17 and verse 1 addresses that. We don't lie or try to deceive God in our prayer. If you do, it's going to be hindered. And or it could be the simple fact of you being a liar and a deceitful individual in general. But if you examine scripture, it, it could apply in both directions. And I just, I'm like, how would you try to, that would mean that if you try to lie to God in your prayer, that means if you close the door at home, God doesn't see it, right? <laughs> or if you hide it in the dark place, God won't find it. So you're all good, right? I mean, that's about how much sense that makes. But yet, yeah, it's addressed, Psalm 17, verse 1, it will hinder our prayers. And then just to help you wrap up, not abiding in Jesus. And where we talk about that word abide is to act in accordance with um, and then, of course, lack of Bible teaching and preaching, and then the big one that public prayer gets everybody in trouble with is you pray from a perspective to impress. You want to impress those around you. You want to use big words. You, you want to use words that you don't even understand half the time what they say in my case. So don't worry. I won't do that one because I don't know big words. Y'all, I told you all about the situation with being parched, right? I mean, y'all still laughing at me. It's okay. It's about the biggest word I know. And I learned that in and, and the first year we were married. So I'll never forget what parched means. I ask me any other word, I don't have a clue. So we, we talked, that was two weeks ago, just to review. And then we talked about David reflecting, being angry and do not sin. It's going to go over a little bit into tonight. There's an aspect, I wish I would have been ahead of the game. 
in studying Psalm 5 as we discussed, be angry and do not sin, and then Ephesians 4, 26, do not let the sun go down on your anger. Why not? Why don't let the sun go down on your anger? You know, everybody thinks this is between husband and wife, right? It's not, it doesn't just apply between husband and wife. It's do not let the sun go down on your anger, period. No matter if you're mad at a brother, a co-worker, a friend, do not let the sun go down on your anger. Why not? Wake up angry. Wake up angry is number one. Can you sleep? Are you at peace with God? Yeah, like you might think you are, but are you? No. no. And we'll we'll look at we'll look at we'll refer back to that a little bit. And then and then we discussed meditating within your heart. Uh, to fill our hearts and mind with God's word. We looked at Psalm 119, 97 through 104, and then Psalm 119, 9 through 16 uh, is where the famous verse, hide God's word in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And then offering sacrifices of righteousness. What is that in regards to you and I? We don't take out a, we don't go and get a lamb and Two years old, blemish free, uh, basically a perfect animal, uh, and slit its throat and bleed it out and throw it out an altar of sacrifice. We don't do that anymore. Jesus Christ was the final sacrifice. We're not required to that. But we talked about sacrifices of righteousness. Can we offer sacrifices of righteousness? If we can, how do we do it? Why is quiet? Well, we don't we don't need to sacrifice anymore. What's that? Are you saying now present? Well, sacrifice of righteousness. David refers to it here. Yes, but that was Old Testament. We don't need to do it now. It's not the perspective of sacrificing that you're thinking. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. So are we, are, is David physically talking about a sacrifice here of an animal? Or maybe oneself. Okay. So it is oneself because you're sacrificing yourself in, in righteousness and doing what it says? After and put your trust in the Lord. So we talked about this and how we go about and do that. We should do it today. We should do what this, this implies is giving up your desires. Giving up your desires. Let God have them. That red Corvette, God, I don't want it. It's your, I lay it on the altar. I want what you want. And having that heart and desire. And then David goes on and say, trust in the Lord with your desires. And it's almost, you, you can almost watch people live this out, and it's, it's all according to God's will. But if, you, if they would, if, if you would, well, let me ask you this. How many of you have you ever kept a prayer journal? Wrote down what you've prayed and asked. Yes. Okay? It's a long time ago. I'm not here to, we're, it's, it's, not a, it's not, but we've done a prayer journal. And have you ever taken the time after you've, really done a prayer journal of this day I was asking and God I confessed and, and keeping a journal at what I prayed, not just asking, but just keeping a journal overall of what I've prayed. And it could be the simple fact of changing my heart, changing a circumstance in my life. God work through me for this situation. Um, may I be a positive testimony to this individual. Um, God take this desire, I give it to you. You do a prayer journal like that. And run it for a year. And then I want you, when you reach day 366, I want you to go back on day 366, and I want you to read day one. And I wonder if God will allow your memory to come back and go, you know, I prayed that. And God answered. Maybe he didn't answer on day one, but he answered Whatever. 
and on and on. And I'm not telling you that all you'll find all your um, sharing of your journal will be all completely answered. I'm not saying that. But I will tell you for a fact, you will see God's hand working. And if that doesn't move you, going, I mean, the God I asked for you to use me in this individual's life and, and the, the change you see. And, and that's, it's just amazing. So when we trust in the Lord and we give him our desires, what does Psalm 34 tell us? Psalm 34, give me verse 3, I think. 3 or 4. Yes. But as you study that, does that mean, as we've looked at it, you hear me use it as a reference all the time, does that mean i got a desire in my heart, red Corvette? God's going to give that to me. No. Because when I trust in the Lord, my desires change, and they align with what the Lord wants. And then, why is my heart satisfied and happy? Is it, I change my desires and I no longer want a red Corvette? No, with God, I my desires change. I don't care about that red Corvette. And it's truly a change. It's truly, I don't care anymore. And you're like, well, yeah, you're just saying that. No, when you buy your desires with God, they change and you want the desires that God has for your life, and if it's not a red Corvette, you may still like it, but it doesn't become, it, it's no longer a driving force. You're not putting money in the savings account to buy it. It's, I don't care. They're nice, but I don't need one. Psalms 37. It's 37, 3? 37, 4. Okay, I apologize. I sent you to Psalm 34. Forgive me. I get Psalm 34 and 37 flipped all the time. So 37 4, I apologize. I sent you to Psalm 34. So we see those the desires of our heart that God will grant us, the desires of our hearts. But they're when we're in alignment with Him. So offering these sacrifices of righteousness, we need to lay our desires on the altar. Give them to God and see what happens. Give them to God and see what happens. In 6 through 8, we looked at David's blessings. We talked about good gifts. Where do good gifts come? James 1.17 tells us good gifts only come from the Father above. And we looked at the blessings that God grants. That David is just as more satisfied. He says, you have put gladness in my heart more than in season that their grain and wine increase. So speaking of society, it's exactly what that says. When is society happy? When they have abundance. The time that the wine and grain is in season. The time of harvest. Everybody's wallet's full at the time of harvest. David said, no. My heart is glad. I'm full of gladness and joy all the time. No matter if I have or I don't have. I just gave you a hint. So you know who else said that. No matter if I have plenty, I'm trying to use the category. In season. Mm, I'm not, I know what you're talking It's not the in season. But, uh, oh, whether I abound or whether I uh, keep negative side It's Paul. Exactly. Whether I'm whether I'm hungry or whether I'm whether I'm starving, whether I'm full, whether I'm blessed, or whether I whether I sleep on rocks or sleep in comfort, I'm satisfied. Philippians four two twelve. I'm, I'm at joy. I should know that. And it doesn't. He he says the same thing. So David is here. Well, Paul reinforces what David says here: is you have put gladness in my heart more than in the season that their grain and wine increased. And then I will both lie down in peace. And we looked at this thing, sleep. He sleeps well. And this is what I shared with you. True, true joy and peace do not depend on the circumstances. What does it depend on? Peace. Our, our relationship, our trust, whatever it is, it depends on, actually what I had written was that actually it depends on trust in God. 
So it's not the circumstances of our life that bring us true joy and peace. It is our trust in God. All right? And in supporting that scripturally is Romans 14, 17, and then, of course, the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 22 through 25. So let's take a look and let's jump into, um, from the study guide I'm using, uh, Psalm 5. Psalm 5. Any questions in regards to Psalm 4? Any questions, comments? You see it, thanks. So let's jump into Psalm 5 and see if we can get into the perspective and see if there's any relation. I want you to look for the relation. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. I want you to, I want you to see if there's any reference in regards to David and his heart here as we see this prayer. <laughs> no, they're not. They didn't grease them up. I just thought, I was like, huh? why? Yeah, yeah. The emotion. No, they didn't grease them up. I did okay. All right, verse, uh, Psalm 5 and verse 1, beginning there, says, Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. Give heed to the voice of my cry, my King and my God. For to you I will pray. My voice you shall hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning I will direct it to you, and I will look up. For you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness, nor shall evil dwell with you. The boastful, the boastful shall not stand in your sight. You hate all workers of iniquity. You shall destroy those who speak falsehood. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. I doubt we're going to even get that far tonight, but we'll give it a shot. <laughs> Let me ask you a very right out the gate. Let's, let's, let's ask the question. What's the relation between Psalm 4 and Psalm 5 and what we've discussed already? Crying out to God. Okay, crying out to God, yes. When does David cry out to God in this psalm? Okay, so... In the morning, what did we just get done looking at in Psalm 4? In the evening. Huh? The evening, him laying down. No, the sleep, yes, I agree. But more of direction of Psalm 4 and verse 4. It was be angry and do not sin. Why? Yes, do not let the sun go down on your anger. Why? What must you do when you wake up and go to prayer before the Lord? Be with, in a good spot there in your life, giving praise to God, not getting up and. That anger moves with you. It is, David is referring here in his time of prayer and asking God for guidance in his life. When is he asking? What time of day? Morning. Very first thing. We're gonna we're gonna have we'll probably have an opinionated discussion in regards to that. Um, scripture, of course, says pray without ceasing. Uh, there are several things as we look at Christ and his life. The majority, because you're gonna find Christ praying in the afternoon, and you're gonna find Christ praying in the evening. But the majority of the time that Christ prayed was when? In the morning. Normally you find Christ seeking God first. But you can't say on a, in a dogmatic stance that that's the only time that you should seek after God in prayer is in the morning. But David starts out with this, give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. Give heed to the voice of my cry, my king, and my God. What is he? What is he starting out here with? Crying out to God. Yeah, he's crying out to God, but first he's addressing God and and really making the statement. David does not tell God what to do, 
But in his confidence and prayer, he makes statements that he knows God's going to do. Not that David is in control, but he has that much faith in God. And how about his give ear? Give ear to my words, O Lord. What is he asking for? Consider my meditation. Give heed to my voice. All three of those are grouped together. Hear me. Hear me. God, be my audience of my prayer. How many times do we really ask God to hear us? I mean, I want you to think about it for a minute. When we pray, I'm guilty of this, because I thought through this, and I'm guilty. When I pray, I address God, my Heavenly Father. But do I ask Him to hear me? Or do I not? Well, it's God, and you know, He's all God, He's all this, He's all that, which He is. I don't want to take away that he's not. He is. But we're, we're going through, I don't know who I just talked with yesterday. I don't know if it was with the concert or early in the day. They were sharing with me someone that was just talking with them, telling them they don't understand how they could be a Christian because they have to do all these things. And I don't know what else. I wish I remember but whoever I was talking to, I said, yeah. I said, doing all those things is what? I said, you're not in a relationship doing all those things. All of those things are what? You're practicing a religion. religion. And take that over to the same aspect of David here praying, to, praying out to God and asking him to hear him. When we pray... Do we pray from a perspective of a personal relationship? Or do we pray from a perspective of assumption? A lot of times, personal relationship is what I'm talking about here. We treat God exactly how you and I don't want to be treated. I want you to think about it for a minute. And I'm talking a personal relationship. I am not talking about God is superior authority. He is. But a personal relationship with God, we make many, many assumptions that we don't want made of ourselves. And I think if we think about that, and as we study through what David does, is it important to ask God to hear you? Who are you praying to? Your father. I mean, you're praying to God. Yeah, well, I, I appointed him by name. I said, dear Heavenly Father. I, I addressed him. But how did Jesus? We studied, we studied the uh, we studied the prayer of Christ. How did he pray? Our Father who art in heaven, addressed him, and then what? Holy is your name. Holy, what? Holy is your name. Holy, or hallowed be thy name. Addressing God, that who he, recognizing that fact, and that is what David is doing here. Give me, God, give, or give ear to my words. Be my audience, is what I have as I pray. And he says that three times. Of course, give ear, consider my meditation, and give heed to my voice of my cry. Do you want, if you look at your personal relationships here, do you want individuals to listen to you when you talk, when you ask, when you say something? Or are you just going to walk in the living room and sit down and just start talking? Oh, there's a bird. Yeah, look, that bird's blue. And the other individual stared at the TV and not any attention to you at all. What did you do? You assumed what? And we look at that, and on all of our parties, do we like that? No. 
What is it? Normally, it's a place of contention. Did you hear me? Well, what, oh, you said something? I'm looking at that perspective. I am talking and sharing tonight a personal relationship. Do you believe your Heavenly Father is personal? I got Billy Jean on. And, and I'm not going to put her on the spot. I'm going to help her. Why is he personal? Why? Because of who? Jesus Christ in the personal relationship that Jesus Christ showed, not just as my Heavenly Father. You've heard me share it with you time and time again, and it is the perfect example. Jesus used it twice in, in, in teaching us of crying out, Abba, Father. God wants what David is saying here. He wants a personal relationship. Don't just follow a prayer of words. He wants a personal relationship. So in this, he, he, he begs God for his attention. And then he goes on to, and of course, then he claims God. My king and my God. The word king there mean anything? Think of David, because it means a ton, just to help you. My king. What does, what does king mean to us humans? And I, I'm putting God in the spiritual realm now, but it, us, it came to us. It's our earthly ruler, right? If we think of the perspective of David, and it's capitalized here, and he's referring to God, but as his king, what would David understand about using the word king beyond using the word God? God is that spiritual application of my heavenly father. And he's, claim, he's making claim. He's not just making claim to God spiritually, my heavenly father. But God, you are my king here, right here. It goes right along the line with the thought of making that claim that I often ask people, when do you have eternal life? When does Jesus tell you you have eternal life? The moment you accept. John chapter 17 and verse 3. Do you have eternal life today? Are you living your eternal life? The answer is yes. I have it right now. It's just hard for our mind to put our grasp around it because we think our eternal life begins when? When we die. Then I experience my eternal life. Well, no, you experience it now because Jesus Christ has granted it to you through his death on the cross as soon as you receive him. So we see the thing here that David writes, my king, my king, he's giving God his authority in his life as the very understanding of an individual that's walking this earth, and you have a king. We all know the king and how the king has authority in an individual's life, referring to him as a true king. So then he goes on and says, for to you, I will pray. What, is, what does he mean by that? So. Very good. I'm going to share with you from this little blurb here in the study guide. I don't follow this to a T, but this isn't mm -hmm. mine. Um, Tori, uh, not Tozer, but I'm trying to tell you his first name. Last name is Tori. He's a spiritual uh, writer. Um, and he, said, he says this, Very much of so-called prayer, both public and private, is not unto God. In order that a prayer should be really unto God, there must be a definite and conscious approach to God when we pray. We must have a definite and vivid realization that God is bending over us and listening as we pray. 
I don't need to read that again. You got it, right? Is that a true statement? Do you agree with that statement? You gotta think through it. I mean, I'll, I'll read it again. I have to read it a couple of times before. <laughs> well, what's what's throwing you off is we must have a definite and vivid realization that God is bending over us and listening as we pray. That's that's throwing you off because that throws the alarm. Hold on, God doesn't bend over and beg me to pray and sits there and listens to me. But in the whole context of what He has said. It goes on to what we've already looked at. Now, this is this is a writer, separate of the study guide. It goes on to look at that he's talking about a personal relationship. Do you want to know when you're being addressed? Do you want to know when you're expected to answer? Yeah. Do, you see, do you see what I'm changing? What's that? It happened. Yeah. But, but I... In aspect, I'm not disrespecting, and I don't want you to think I am tonight, the authority of God. He begs us to come and pray to him. But as we study David and praying, David longed for that personal relationship and touch. And I think we miss that in our prayers. I think we miss it in our prayers because we make assumptions about God. And uh, well, I, I addressed him, dear Heavenly Father. David goes beyond just addressing dear Heavenly Father. He says, God, I pray to you, only to you. Will you hear me? God, I know you'll hear me. You are my God and my King. Do, do you see David's? I, I can't see it anymore. And in what Tori said, do you see that personal touch? David is like, after he pours his heart out in the beginning of his prayer, he kind of almost goes, okay, God, now I know I have your attention. Now I know you're listening to me. Because wife, husband, I called you by name, you lifted up, and you looked at me dead in the eye. Don't tell me you didn't hear me. It's a personal relationship. And David is giving God that consideration that so many people, including myself, don't think we have to give God because He's Almighty. He's up, and He is. But do you want? We want that spiritual relationship with God, of course. But how close do you want to be to God personally? Do you look at your relationship with God? Can be personal. Because that's what we see in David. That's what we see in David's heart as he addresses God. As we look, then he goes on to any questions in regards to any thoughts and comments. I don't want to leave this statement to leave you lingering that I said I agree with it. I do 100%. I'll read it one last time. Just very much of so called prayer, both public and private. So it's not just from the pulpit, it's in our own prayer lives is not unto God. In order that a prayer should be really unto God, there must be a definite and conscious approach to God when we pray. We must have a definite and vivid realization that God is bending over us and listening as we pray. I'm going to ask you a quick question. How many of us at dinner truly pray to God? I want you to think about that. Leave that be. Just that, that is a prayer right there before dinner. How many of you truly believe we truly pray to God before dinner? Or are they just words? Hurry up, let's eat. Amen. Bless this food, bless hands, partake. The prepared it, bless me, forgive me straight from it. Thank you, Lord. Amen. And give me my food. And I think if we're careful and we're honest with ourselves. We could probably take a little application from our prayer before a meal, and could that be a habitual thing that could creep into our time in prayer that we 
bow before the Lord, and that is our mindset then of God. Yeah, the Bible tells me I need to pray. So I'm going to pray. Just out of back of the back of the I don't know who I was talking to. Friday <laughs> morning. Um, but last week, I woke up from a dead sleep. And I don't know why. I've shared with you many, many times that as I've asked God, just in my mornings are busy, God, show me where you want me to pray. I want to pray. Show me. And I've shared with you that many, many times I'm up early in the morning, not lights on, Bibles open, facing my Bible, but I'm, I'm praying at that time. And it was this past Friday, just about, probably about five in the morning. Boom. Wide awake. I mean, wide awake, ready to get up and leave and go for But just not motivated to do something. And I sat there, and I literally, it was, and I'm just sharing this with you, not out of any credit to the kids. It literally, as I work through this and look at that, it's, it's literally that morning I laid in bed, and joyfully, lovingly, without falling asleep halfway through, without anything, literally prayed for an hour and a half. And I was sad to open my eyes and look at her. Why did I do that? I don't know. And then my sinful mind took over, and an hour and a half was what? Go ahead, fill in the fill. An hour and a half was what? Warm. Enough, right? <laughs> right? When really it felt like two or three minutes. Not a lot of my prayer life is like. And I think I had shared with you one time before I went to a uh, prayer meeting and amongst men in the, well, not just men, it was a time that the church was open that we were praying and it was just a morning that was open. And that was another time in my life that literally we prayed for, what, two or three hours and it felt like five minutes. Wow. I mean, I got a handle on it. Why is that? Because we put God on a schedule. That's why. God, I, I gave you a little bit of time. Now I gotta do what? I gotta get on my day. And when God's not on a schedule and you have a true heart to lay before him in prayer, and I mean, that prayer Friday morning, I can still remember this. It's it was wonderful, absolutely wonderful. And I challenge you with a, with a heart before God, have you ever just laid and laid out or just buried it and just prayed to him? And now who cares what that says? Who cares if the sun's coming up? God, I'm before you. Where else should we rather be? I don't always do this, so don't look to me. I'm just giving you an example. And I'm, I'm, it's a shameful thing that I don't always do that. But David goes on here to say, as we look up, he says, My voice to you shall you hear in the morning. O Lord. And, and then he goes on, In the morning I will direct it to you. David made it a point to use these words in the morning. Why? When you get up, you get praise and start your day. Got a question. I wrote for it. This is my own question. This is, I, this is, I, I wrote this up. It's not the study. Who are you going to meet first? God or Satan? Which one do you want to meet first? It's your choice. Because if it's not going to be God, I guarantee you who it's going to be. I don't know if you've ever thought about it like that. Just as I was studying through this, I wrote this right I just wrote this right now. Davis is prayers in the morning. My question is, do you want to meet God before you meet Satan? Who do you want to meet first? Because you're going to meet one or the other. And the question is, just like this is a challenge and just Sunday morning. 
in, in our what do we see God in that prayer in the morning? Is God first? Now, I'm not going to take a dogmatic stance, take my heels in and say that it's sin to pray. You don't pray in the morning, you pray in the afternoon, and that's sin. That's nonsense. That's absolute nonsense. I'm not here to say that. I'm not saying that from this partial scripture either. But I am saying I think it's very, very important that we seek God first. I shared with you the, the, the uh, struggle that I had when I was in Cincinnati of praying. I, I fought with it horribly. And it wasn't a desire not to pray. It was just I find myself so busy that what? Go on about my day. I'd be in my truck ready to go. And down the road I go, and my morning's three quarters away gone, and I haven't even saw God. And I don't, oh, good, okay, you didn't. I'm going to pray on my lunch break. Yep, you say that to yourself. I didn't pray, I'm going to pray when I get home. You will continuously advance that time of when I'm going to pray. And I think I shared with you the, the circumstance that I had to be, I had a little sticky note. That when I got out of my truck at night, all it said is had to be prayer. It's all it said. I wrote a person, a little sticky note. And when I got out of my truck, knowing I was home for the night, I took that sticky note and I stuck right over my speedometer in my truck. Because I had such a horrible time in the morning, getting up, doing this or doing that, and I would never pray. And, and I put that over that because when I got out of my truck, did I always pray when I got in my truck? No. I'd mind me if I did. But what did it make me do? I had to consciously take that sticky note off that so I could see my speedometer and set it on my seat next to me and start my truck and drive away. I had to make a conscious act to ignore praying to God. In the morning. And that's why I'm not here tonight to, to say the morning's the only time. It was a struggle I had, and I had to make and folks, there were many days. I gotta go. I'll catch you at lunch, God. I didn't do it. But it was a conscious act of mine. And I will tell you, God used that in my life with. As I, as I share with you, feeling God's arms around you when you put your morning before him and say, God, I don't want to sin against you. And then the minute you do, you just feel his loving arms around you and, and you don't even need to hear the whisper because you know. You, you already know. And it was some of that time in my life that it was... Pray lunch, or I got a break at this. Even though I did it because I had to make a conscious decision, and in that time that I, as I wrote that note, I said, "God, hold me accountable to this note, and make sure I'm making." I asked Him to make sure I was making the right decision. Did I always make the right decision? Mm. No, but it was a conscious decision of mine. To pull that off and set it, or it was a conscious decision of mine to go. Is this this reason? God, let me stop. Let me find it. Excuse me. Just remember it. Turn with me to Mark 1 and 35. Jesus declares here, uh oh, 735 to 135. My handwriting is getting worse and worse by the day. I think it's 135. Mm -hmm. We'll get there and I'll tell you. Maybe you find it on the computer, am I right? Early, early in the morning you know, while okay, it was. Yeah, yeah, there we go. It is 135. I had a little, I had a little chair hanging at the top of that one, and I'm like, ooh, is that seven? <laughs> or is that five? It is one. It says here, now in the morning. Having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place 
And there's, he did what? Pray. Who are we talking about? Jesus. Who is it? This is Jesus. One of the many references we see in Scripture that Jesus saw. And, and how early? Early. Before daylight. Uh, another translation says, before many arose. So before anyone else was up. Two aspects there. Why? Quiet and peace. And, and what does that quiet and peace bring you? To who? To God. My God. And who else? Me. That's it. I don't have Jack coming up. Grandpa, Grandpa! I, I don't have whatever. I don't have my cell phone ringing. I don't have those things. And, and the other perspective of this portion of Scripture is where did he go? To the solitary place. Why? Because of that, is, there's no, it's between me and my God. And I wonder if, if we look at our prayer lives, do we have that? Or, I hope you guys see, when I give you an example, I'm not pointing fingers at you. Because the examples I give you, probably because it's what I do. Or do I go, all right, what time is it? 6.50. Set my phone right here. Anybody tell the call? All right, now I'm going to pray. Is that a solitary place? Yeah. Where is my focus? Is my focus on God? No. I've, I've prepared and said, God, as long as no one calls, You're first. I'm going to pray. But if my phone rings, you need to understand somebody's calling. Does that fit John 135 or Mark 135? No. Not in the example we see of Jesus. Undisturbed. Undisturbed. Here, here's another uh, little uh, thing from Hudson Taylor. Famous missionary to China. Had trouble finding time alone. This may sound familiar to you. I have I had nothing to do with this guy. I don't even know who he is. This is why that sounds familiar to you. You're going to go, Dan, it wasn't this guy that gave me the idea. I, I don't even know who he is. But the famous missionary in China had trouble finding time alone with God. He began to wake himself up when? At 2 a.m. in the morning and used those quiet hours when everyone else slept to commune with God. I don't even know who Hudson Taylor is, but he's a famous missionary to China. So that quietness and the time that we should have with God is what we see in David's heart. <clears throat> the question is, I mean, it goes right along with what we've been studying as we wrap up the end of the year with our series, Is God First? This is in my way waiting for it to ring if someone needs me, it's God first. As long as this doesn't ring. But is my mindset God first? No, it's not. And we let those things, those things get in our way. And we say that it's not a big deal. Ladies, and men, all of us together, You're in a heartfelt, serious conversation with your husband or wife. And this rings. Yeah. Oh, I got a letter for him, okay? Unless it's the kids. Oh, no. No, no, no. I'm not going to let you go there. Are you, look, are you even going to check it? Oh, yeah. Check it. After. I'm not <laughs> I'm asking the perspective of us. We are talking tonight about that personal touch that David has a desire as he prays to God. He wants that personal touch with his Heavenly Father. That's what I'm focused on. Okay, as this prayer that he asked for guidance. Through this prayer, we'll see the we'll see how God treats the wicked and the, and the righteous as we get in there. But we're looking at that personal touch. I want that personal communication, and I want God's personal attention to me as I give mine to Him. 
We can relate. Now, please, don't, don't take God's mighty sovereignty, all his attributes, out of him by any means. But we need to oftentimes think of the assumptions we make that God understands. I want to ask you gentlemen and you ladies, when you're in a heartfelt conversation, that you want your husband's or your wife's 100% and this rings, and they tell you to hold on for a second. What did it do to the conversation? <laughs> I'm just asking you because our personal relationships, that personal touch, God has given us relationships in our lives here to relate. So many times, well, God's, we got to worship God in spirit and in truth, right? Yeah, we do. But God still wants that personal relationship with us. That personal, when, when, when we're in those conversations with people that are important to us, and we know that they need our attention or we need their attention, if, if you're the one that's needing the attention, and you're not the one that's having the attention desired from you, you're needing it. And this goes up. Hey, can you hold on a second? What place did you just take? No longer are you first in their attention if you need it. Or if you're the one giving, what did you just say? Hold on. I could have something. Be truthful. I could have something more important that I need to check. And I'll be back with you in a minute. Guys, please don't look at me that I have this great idea. I'm talking to you. So I'm not talking to you from the point of conviction. I'm asking you from a point of challenge. And the perspective, do we have that personal time, that personal relationship, as David is declaring, I knew we weren't going to get into, for you are not, or for, yes, for you are, or excuse me, in the morning, and then verse 4, we're going to stop here. But for you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness. We're getting into the wicked and righteous separation in David's prayer. But do we have a personal relationship with God? I hope the answer is yes. I have that personal relationship with God. Not just one that we deem as spiritual, that he saved me through Jesus Christ. Yes, I got it. I believe it. It's all true. But is that all that God wants? Is you're a believer in Jesus Christ, in Jesus' name, amen, I'm saved, and God, what more you want? Is that what he wants? I'll tell you. He'll get you to heaven. You believe in Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, that's good enough, and I truly believe. I'm not here to debate that. He'll get you to heaven. What won't you ever experience in this life? True blessing from God. That personal relationship. Because that is where I can say this. Bet on both sides of the coin. That is where Christianity becomes easy. That's where Christianity becomes. I shared with the native yesterday, I had an opportunity to invite a person that did exactly what I thought they were going to do with my invitation. And some of you may know him, I'm not going to mention his name, but I bought, a, I bought another truck. And this individual had bought several trucks from him. And as I was going to meet with him, because he was fixing something out that I found, I went and met with him. And as I was meeting with him, what text did I send you yesterday morning? Remember? I signed to invite, pushed that final invite. And just as I got out of my truck, that text that I sent to you, God took and whacked me right beside the head with it and said, why would you send that text if you're not willing to do it yourself? I didn't go with the heart of inviting this individual. I went with the heart of, did he fix the concern that I had with the truck? And then as I got out of my truck, 
I got whacked because I sent you guys that text. And God said, hey, I think this is your only contact of not going out of your way of running into someone. What are you doing? And it just hit me. So I stopped. You know, I, had truck. I had invitations on my seat. I grabbed an invitation and walked in his office, and talking with him, and went out and looked at the truck. The, the item was fixed on the truck. And, and uh, he's like, okay, well, take it for a drive and come back. And I said, well, before I go, I said, because I don't know if you'll be here if I bring the truck back or not. And I'll set the keys, whatever. And I don't know if you'll be here, but I, just, I want to invite you. I know it's short notice. But I want to invite you. Ah, oh, what's that? And he didn't just say, ah, oh, what's that? He shared some adjectives of what's that. So I was like, wow, we're starting off the wrong foot to go inviting you to an evening to celebrate Christmas. But anyways, I didn't let that phase me. I was just like, no, I'm going to share this with him. I want him to come. And I shared it with him and told him, I said, it's just, a con- it's just a Christmas concert. Christ and Christmas. I said, you and your wife would absolutely love it. What you've been through, I think you would find it a blessing. Why don't you come? He took the invitation, looked at it, right on the back of the GDs. Ah, yeah, maybe. And go ahead and test drive the truck, and that's about where it goes. When we want that personal relationship with God, I will tell you the honest truth. Probably maybe months, maybe two years, two years. I'm not going to try to give you the exact time. But there was a time I would have been extremely fearful to give this man that invitation. Why? Because how he would respond? No, he ain't going to respond violently to me in any way, shape, or form. I'm not going to be threatened in any way. What might he think of me? Huh? When we have the relationship and it's personal with God, can I say this way because I don't know how else to explain it? I don't care what he thinks. I don't care. You want to label me as a Jesus freak? Thank you. Thank you. I'm not really one. And, and as I think that, I should do back flips. Thank you. You want to label me that way? You want to avoid me? Because I was willing to be obedient to God and offer you through God using me the greatest gift that you may ever receive? Do we think of it like that? Or do we think of it selfishly of God? They're not going to listen to me. Now, he didn't. He didn't show up. These bums that I invited, none of them showed up. So frustrating. But that's okay. Let's not quit. But he just took that... Right on the old back of the GPU to rebuild it. But it was easy. And why I didn't why I didn't go there with that mentality, I don't know. But it was piece of cake to hand the invitation and invite. No issues. And I think it's as we grow in our relationship with God and we become more personal with Him, what who does it matter what they think of us? Is it more important what God thinks of me? Or is it more important of how my friend may see me, or how an acquaintance may see me, or why in the world did you invite me there? You know I go to whatever. You know I told you I don't want anything to do with that. So, any questions for tonight? As we see David's heart, David's heart is one that desires the personal relationship with him. And when we think of personal, I truly believe God's word with all my heart is a personal that you and I have in our lives. We can experience that. We don't want to be treated as often as how we treat God when we pray. We would look at, what are you doing? You didn't even ask me. No, you're right, I did. I expect it. And we don't want that. But we expect God. So, all right, let's take this time tonight to go before the Lord in prayer. We have any... uh